Oman, Tunisia, Yemen. Uh, it seems that the establishment of private credit bureau, it is stopped by the fact that there is not a bespoke regulation or law. This is a total alibi. You don't need a law or a regulation to establish a private credit bureau. Bank secrecy is generally the finger behind which the banks hide themselves because they don't want to share data, as simple as that. But were I to ask you, what is the country with the most rigid bank secrecy? What is the first name that comes up to your mind? Switzerland. Switzerland is a very nice example. Switzerland started a private credit bureau in 1968. No law, no regulation, no supervision. Everything based on the consent of the customer, of the borrower, to share data among lenders and with the credit bureau. So, Anybody who tells you that there is a legal problem to start a credit bureau in your countries, don't believe it. There is a solution. <laughs> this is the major problem. Banks don't want to share data generally among them, even less with other sectors. In Egypt, private credit bureau is owned 100% by the banks. And for two years, they have avoided the possibility that microfinance institution would share data with them. Simply, they didn't want to share data with microfinance institutions. And since microfinance institutions are not regulated, the central bank could do nothing to convince them to do it. So this is one of the major problems. How regulators are tackling it? Well, just mandating both sharing of information with private credit bureaus and inquiries. Um, there are two ways you can do this. The Morocco model. In Morocco, when we started the project, Bank Al Maghrib was willing to set up to revamp their credit registry. We understood that banks, non-banking financial institutions, and microfinance were willing to set up three different private credit bureaus. Imagine, three vertical silos with different information not talking to each other. Nobody in that country would have had a complete picture of a customer. I could have had a credit card with a bank, microfinance loan with microfinance, and maybe a personal loan with non-banking financial company. And nobody would share the data. And I could trick with everybody, OK? So we told Bank Al Maghrib, use this model, which is very nice and could be adopted in countries where banks don't want to share information. Every month, Bank Al Maghrib gets all the information from regulated entities and passes it on to the private credit bureaus. One today, two next year. The non-regulated entities can share the information directly with the private credit bureaus, and then the private credit bureaus will sell the information and the credit reports to everybody. Second main model is where the central bank has not direct role in treating and processing the information. They are just the supervisor of the private credit bureau. So in this case, the information is given by all lenders, regulated and non-regulated, to the private credit bureaus who then sells their product to, to, to the members. Finally, uh, one weak point is borrower's right. We must understand that the quality of a database, whatever it is, public credit registry of the central bank or private credit bureau, is an ensured by the possibility that we, borrowers, can inspect, see the data. If there is a mistake, we can correct it. Uh, it is interesting to know that 60% of the quality of the database today in the world is due to the fact that borrowers can see their information and ask to be corrected. And this in MENA is not happening. 
particularly when we speak about public credit registers. So, to close my presentation and leave some time for discussion, um, there are many um, areas of improvements, as I was mentioning before, but we have started a long, a long walk. And um, I think this is the strategy we, we should follow in the next eight years. So um, the first wave is uh, consolidate what we have, at least revamp every credit registry. There are credit registries in MENA that are still operating on paper, manual, Excel files. At least revamp that. Uh, establish credit bureaus where the credit system, where the, the culture of credit is more ahead than other countries. And from 2014 and 2016, try to establish private credit bureaus everywhere, where the culture of sharing information would be spread in all of our countries in the region. We can afford to do that. And then later on, you know, uh, do something different, like introducing value-added services, retail management risk, scoring, and all these things. But one thing is very important, and what we are doing today is exactly part of that. Awareness raising and financial education in all the phases is 80% of our work. So if anybody tells you that credit reporting is about technology and legal framework, don't believe it. 80% of our work, 80% of credit reporting establishment is about creating a financial envir environment with the right culture. So, shukran, and uh, I leave the floor to you. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, we can uh, open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, if uh, we would like to, if you have any um, inquiries on uh, Hafid's and Oscar's presentations, please go ahead. Uh, there's a mic here. I have two questions to Mr. Hafid and Mr. Alejandro. Both of you, you raised, I, I know the, uh, the benefits of, of the financial bureau, but as you mentioned, in particular, you said Sudan was the lowest, lowest in terms of the graphs. <coughs> From experience, uh, like 10 years ago or nine years ago, most of the banks, they were shying away from doing any business in Sudan, except the Arab Investment Company, because of the relationship. Even though they have no proper financial information, whenever we are asking for any financial, they gave us, like, three years back, while, for example, three years financials, and, uh, but we are doing business with them. We are doing extremely well. And there is no financial, nothing. I, they never defaulted in any of their, of their loans. What we were doing this because of the relationship, and we're doing great. And perhaps we, we were market niche. We, we used to be a market niche uh, where we we're dealing with Sudanese banks, and we had great opportunities with them. Uh, as Mr. Alejandro highlighted the same thing, I know the benefits of, of a credit bureau and information. But from experience, if you look at the financial crisis, most of those banks uh, that got a clear picture of, uh, of the financials, let's have an example of Lehman Brothers, the fifth largest bank worldwide, not just in the USA, triple A rated bank, chapter file, chapter, uh, file chapter 11 overnight. And they have transparent information and everything. Whereas other banks, as I mentioned, in Sudan or maybe even in Libya, in Libya it's the same. In terms of financial uh, infrastructure, it's, it's very poor. They, do, they don't deal with updated financials. Sudan, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, all have the same. But in terms of default, they are least because usually when they are doing any business, they have their, their deposit, like they have collateral, which is deposit, which is most, more secure than uh, lending to any organization just basing on their credit reporting where they can default. 
I, I'm just telling you this from experience because 10 years ago, uh, especially in Sudan, uh, at the Arab Investment Company, for example, no one was doing any business with Sudan. We're doing extremely well, extremely well. Most of the income generated for this company, it was, it was coming from Sudanese business. Thank you. So, uh, too strong? So, two questions. First one, you are speaking about balance sheets and papers, okay? So, we must be very clear for what a credit bureau should be used. It's not for corporate. For corporate, you have million dollars loan. You can afford to spend money on staff, on analysts, on Fitch and Rating and Moody's reports, on balance sheet, and those companies have information. Credit bureaus are not for that customer, type of customer. Credit bureaus are for micro, small, medium enterprises and consumers. Those people who today would not be accepted by a bank unless they have a collateral, okay? So if instead of collateral, you create a reputational collateral, which is based on how you have been paying your previous credit in the last three years, you dispose of collateral, okay? You will continue as a bank to treat your large customers, large, small, medium enterprises, who have documentation for which you are loaning lots of money in the same way. Credit bureaus is taking care of that part of the population that today is neglected, the underserved, the poor, the micro, okay? Second question. The US have been using credit scoring and credit bureaus since 1960s. And everything went well until 2007, when securitization and everything started. Banks were relying, for the first time in their history, totally on collateral, on the price of the houses they were uh, lending money for. Everybody was thinking that the pickup of the prices of the houses would never stop. So they forgot about scoring, they forgot about credit bureaus, they did not use them any longer. And that is the reason why the crisis started. Plus the greed, plus the fact that the risk was spread all over the world, and many reasons. But the main reason was that you cannot give a loan to a McDonald's employee who earns $1,500 per month with a monthly installment of $2,500. That was the history of the subprime, and we are still paying the price. But the credit bureaus were neglected during the whole history. If they were continued to be used, probably we were not being here to discuss it today. Yeah, if you allow me, I want to just add uh, one quick comment on that. Uh, as, as, as you know, uh, credit reporting business is based on trust, definitely. Uh, and that's the reason why, uh, as Oscar explained in his presentation, we are trying to put the appropriate framework with all the laws, all the code of conduct, with the private credit bureau, and among the banking com the community to exchange only information related to credit and not to, uh, let, let's say, for any extra or additional information. Uh, with regard to Sudan, yes, effectively, you are right. They are score Sudan is scoring uh, zero, definitely, in terms of depth of credit information. And maybe you have the chance to work with good customers that they're providing their information, but you are not sure that what they are providing is the, 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 the real situation of those companies. They might have loans inside Sudan or with any additional uh, regional institution, let's say, that provides credit in the region, and you, nev you will never know unless you have the full picture of the, 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 like the financial situation of those companies. So it's, it's not going to be based on the financial statement that they can produce, especially to get your loans, but it, it should be done 
through a, a credit information sharing that will provide you this time with the real situation with any uh, uh, even small or big or medium loan that those companies have, uh, let's say, uh, borrowed from, from the different lenders inside Sudan or outside Sudan. Good morning. First, I would like to thank your uh, excellent presentation. And my, uh, my question, I'm, um, I'm just introducing my, um, I'm managing a family bank in Bahrain, which is a microfinance bank licensed by the Central Bank of Bahrain and um, collaborating with a credit bureau in Bahrain. I have three points just to mention for your uh, kind presentation, what we, uh, uh, really, our, our, our experience when we started to collaborate with a, a credit bureau, we really appreciated kind of drop-in, as you mentioned in the figure. But we have still have kind of uh, worry regarding points. One, the point you mentioned in your presentation that the machinery analysis, it means that we have kind of a machine which is analyzing the behavior of the uh, guy regarding if he has any kind of mistake in his credit history, he just have a, a red point and we are, he is no more access to any finance. Perhaps he has in his, his history kind of accident or whatever. So this is really un, unfair. And the second point, which is uh, my question to you really, uh, the, in, in face of that kind of machinery analysis, do you have any behavioral analysis regarding the category and the population of credit in the main region? Uh, today condition we have banks or uh, an institution like us who have to uh, elaborate the selection entry, okay? You, you check the, his history regarding what he has done in, with uh, banks. But if we do uh, a business with unbankable people who don't have history, they are not more any, they haven't before getting any credit. So they are uh, uh, native regarding that history. And your uh, system doesn't include them. Do you think about putting more behavioral analysis regarding the the holistic population uh, credit performance in a country where we can give us a, one of the uh, information which might assist our uh, analysis. The third point regarding the uh, real expansion of non-conventional uh, financial institution like, uh, for example, financing cars or uh, home appliances. We have now witnessing uh, more and more companies who are providing credit for buying a car and house, uh, whatever houses or home appliances, which, which are not recorded in any of the credit bureau system. So we have customers who have a car loan, who get it from a company who is providing credit, a company not uh, making part of the system. So do you have kind of, uh, in your experience, I don't know everywhere or in global experience. Do you have a kind of obligation where those people are forced to make part of the um, scene system of credit as they are growing and they are out of control and most of uh, many showrooms of cars are getting great credit, which makes more and more, uh, you know, uh, challenging in front of the credit bureau who are working only with financial institutions. And thank you. Thank you for your question, especially the first one is very important. <clears throat> so credit bureaus are fantastic machines, but they have a problem. It's a catch-22 situation. In order to get credit, you must have a credit history. But if you don't have a credit history, how do you create that? So for the informal population, this has been a problem for decades. Um, we have analysis. Um, unfortunately, we did not have time today to show that. But I was mentioning that public utilities information for microfinance institutions is becoming the, the door to open more credit to more people. Okay? There is a very interesting study made by an Italian credit bureau called CRIF. Imagine. We had microfinance institutions starting in Italy in 2007 after the credit crunch. So they had no experience. How do we do that? How do we accept customers? And they requested that based on water bills, 
a credit scoring model could be built. And the result was fantastic. 83% of the people who did not have a credit history inside the bureau and that would be considered not eligible for credit by the banks would represent the same level of risk as you and I, if given uh, trust. So what is the new trend? It's including utilities information inside the credit bureaus, because that will not give the green light to give a micro-entrepreneur who nobody knows a, a car loan tomorrow. But you can start with $200 loan. And if you see that it's paid well, you increase it after six months. And we know that microfinance tenures are m much stricter than banks 24, 36, 60, 60 tenures. So the utilization of utilities information, and especially mobile telephones. All of your customers do not go out in the morning with a platinum card in their pocket, but they have the mobile telephone. And how they use it, how they pay it, is important information. So strive to have that information, change the legislation in every country, because that is important to give more access to credit to those who, by the way, are better payer than the rich. Second question was how to include retailers, how to force them, forcing maybe is not possible. So new laws, central banks are forcing regulated entities to share information and to consult credit bureaus. Because it is clear now, systemic credit risk can be better controlled with private credit bureaus. But they have no power on uh, non-financial commercial entities. There is one example in this uh, region, which is the new UAE, Federal Credit Bureau Law, that mandates everybody. Whatever type of credit you give in the UAE, when the Federal Credit Bureau will be established, because until now it's only in, in the paper is a design, everybody, retailers, mobile telephone companies, will be forced to give information. That is the non plus ultra, OK? Uh, in other cases, you will find, though, that when retailers understand that if they don't have the right picture, the complete picture of what a customer has uh, in terms of exposure with the banks and microfinance, they will come and start to share data. It's uh, a longer pro process, but generally, it, it is how it works. In Latin America, for instance, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, retailers have more customers than the banks inside the credit bureau. In Brazil, there are companies with 20 million customers, which is much bigger than all the banking universe. Just one quick uh, uh, element, since you were talking about uh, behavioral uh, analysis. Uh, as Oscar said, when, when you have all the data inside the database, you would be able at that time to have a behavioral scoring being generated. And this will definitely will help you to define the different segments of your of the population that you may attract as a financial institution, as a non-financial institution, as MFI, as, as any other type of lender. But you need all the data to be in the database, and after that you can build with the financial, uh, the credit bureau, with the, the help and the support of the financial community, they can build an appropriate and effective behavioral uh, scoring that will uh, benefit, of course, everybody in the in the country. Uh, I think we're falling a bit behind in terms of time. So, um, uh, in the interest of time, uh, maybe we can, um, if there are any more questions, we can postpone that to the uh, to the Q and A sessions uh, throughout the day. Uh, now we can maybe uh, take a five, ten minute uh, coffee break uh, and then come back for the uh, session number two. So appreciate if we are uh, back here by 11.30, uh, would be great. Thank you. And everybody relates the movable with the, with the tangibles, the typical the vehicles, machinery, the equipment. But there's much more than that. Um, all the uh, agricultural production, for example, is movable, property, crops, livestock. Uh, consumer goods, um, commodities, intellectual property rights, um, the intangibles are actually 
um, a very good way of financing and something that uh, people usually are not aware of, the accounts receivables, for example, but also bank accounts and insurance policy, et cetera. So that's just a little bit um, of background on secure transactions. Uh, why is it important for MENA? Um, there, recently, the World Bank did a publication uh, the, as part of a financial sector flagship in the MENA region, which included a chapter on this. And part of my presentation is going to be about, about that. Um, it, but secure transactions, it's, it's important for MENA for, for two main reasons. Uh, one is because of the huge SME finance gap that the region faces. It's been estimated uh, by uh, a recent study done by McKinsey and the, and the IFC that the uh, gap, the financing gap that uh, small and medium enterprises would uh, uh, need uh, to uh, you know, develop their, their businesses further, it's between 165 and 200 billion dollars, right? So financial institutions have to provide that to cater to the needs of the SMEs at the moment. The second uh, main reason why this is needed here is because of the collateral gap. Um, and I am providing some information here that uh, corresponds to the doing bits to, to the sorry to the enterprise uh, surveys from the World Bank which tells us that um, when you look at the composition of assets for, a, for an average business, this comes from surveys to a number of businesses in, in different countries, including MENA, and when you look at the composition of the assets of that business, um, these surveys tell us that 78% um, of those assets are composed of movable property basically things like inventory, receivables, and, and equipment, and only 22% is composed of, of immovable property. Now, when we look at the other side of the spectrum, uh, and what are, what are the assets that financial institutions are asking businesses when they uh, are getting loans, it's completely the opposite. They're asking for about 80% of the loans are secured with immovable property, and only 20% are secured with movable property. So it is, there is a huge dichotomy in the types of assets that businesses have and the types of assets that financial institutions are asking for. Uh, it is also very important to improve these systems here because, um, because it's actually the region worldwide that has the weakest creditor rights, uh, creditors and borrowers' rights protection. Uh, this area has completely been neglected uh, in this region for many years, despite the number of uh, attempts by international financial bodies, uh, like the G20, um, uh, G22, sorry, after the financial crisis in Asia in 1998, Basel I and two, and, uh, and then uh, recently, most recently, the G20, which has uh, included in their SME policy framework has included uh, secure transactions, creditor rights as one of the key pillars of the financial infrastructure and one of the key elements that countries need to have to avoid uh, systemic crisis. But despite that, uh, you know, this has completely been neglected by, by central banks, by, uh, by governments, by ministries of finance, uh, and even by financial institutions. Uh, who haven't actually lent much uh, in that sense. We also um, get data, we've, we've spoken before about this, uh, other speakers have spoken about the weakness of the legal rights index, which precisely refers to the borrowers and, uh, and creditors' rights and to the secure transaction systems in a country. The MENA region is by far the worst worldwide. By far, I mean, it's, it's, it's half of those, uh, of those scores of other regions, right? Even Sub-Saharan Africa scores six out of 10, while the MENA region on average is only scoring three. So uh, this, this gives you an idea of, um, of how bad the situation is in the region. Um, I'm, I'm mentioning here some of the uh, benefits of secure transactions, modern secure transaction systems. Um, Increasing access to credit, obviously, and reducing the risk of credit is one of the most important ones, especially catering to the SME sector, as we discussed before. This type of system actually promotes more prudent lending because banks are taking less risks when, you, when, when they have robust systems that create transparency about the assets that are being used. 
uh, it reduces the cost of credit. Obviously, everybody knows that when you have a, a secured loan, it's, uh, you, you probably are giving your client a, a lower interest rate than with an unsecured loan. But I think also the effect of businesses who are starting to get loans by the uh, formal sector, by the for formal banking sector, are obviously getting lower interest rates than with the informal sector if they're using collateral. It promotes credit diversification, moving from uh, having a portfolio all secured with immovables to movables. And then finally, it increases market competition. Uh, we've seen an increase in certain industries in countries where these systems have developed, industries like factoring and leasing, and also the importance of the non-bank financial institution sector is critical in the formation of a, of a solid uh, financial system. Uh, also more statistics here about MENA, only 25% of businesses have access to a line of credit, the lowest again worldwide. Uh, the use of bank uh, uh, loans to finance investments by companies, again the lowest worldwide uh, on 60, 16%. Um, and uh, and a, a characteristic here that I wanted to point out is that up until now, uh, Oscar was, was giving us the picture of the before and after, right? I cannot do that because uh, we're, on, we're still in the before, right? There, there has been no reforms in the secure transaction systems in any of the MENA countries up to today. Meaningful reforms, I mean. Uh, we are, IFC is working in a number of countries and, uh, and uh, there have been uh, some laws passed already. Afghanistan, for example, has now a law, doesn't have the registry yet, but up to today, there is not a single country in the Middle East that's, that has a modern secure transaction system. So hopefully, when I come back in three years, I'll be able to follow and copy uh, Oscar's um, model of showing the before and after. Um, so why are in banks lending? Uh, we've done a lot of like, diagnostics and we know throughout the world what are the main reasons for banks not being, uh, not accepting movable property as collateral. And these are the four main reasons. Uh, there, there are no more than these ones, right? Uh, so the first one is the lack of an adequate legal framework that, that can protect their rights. Uh, things like, uh, you know, being able to, uh, to use all types of assets as collateral, uh, central bank regulations that allow them to use those assets as collateral. Priority of creditors has to be uh, an important part of the system, enforcement issues, etc. The second one is the lack of a, of a registry where they can actually um, um, consult to make sure that uh, the assets that are, they are taking are not taken already by other banks, right? So this is a critical element of the system that is what gives all the transparency to the system and the ability for banks to, uh, to lend uh, knowing that they're not taking a, a higher risk. Uh, again, here in the region, no, no modern collateral registries. Uh, the third one is the lack of know-how on how to do this type of lending. Obviously, obviously, if you're gonna be lending to a supermarket and taking the inventory of that supermarket as collateral, you, you need, you need uh, to know how to evaluate that collateral, first of all. You need to know how to, to monitor that collateral, the inflows and, uh, that are going into the inventory and how uh, the company is doing it. The same with receivables, right? You cannot, do, uh, you cannot use the same techniques uh, by just lending uh, to a company taking the, the immovable property as if you were taking uh, the receivables of that company because you need to know how, uh, how that works. And so that's another area why, why they don't do it. And then finally, um, we find out in, in some countries that banks are simply not interested in, in lending to SMEs just because uh, you know, they get their revenues from other sources and there is not enough market competition in the, in the place, and so they don't need to lend, really. Um, and uh, unless you know, there will be more competition, I think they will, they will not uh, be willing to lend anyway. Um, so um, I, I just wanted to mention what the main principles of a modern secure transaction system is, which are basically defined here. And it's not only about the law, uh, it, 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 is, it is a broader scheme. I, I think it's, you obviously need to have the legal framework which complies with these principles, but then you need to have the infrastructure, the collateral registry, and then you need to have um, a, a component in which there is a change in the credit culture, in which banks are actually uh, willing to uh, take and, and do this type of, of financing once they have that infrastructure in place. 
Um, so these are the elements I will, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to touch on the three areas um, that were, where we have seen um, that the MENA region is really weak. And, and most of the countries in the MENA region have um, important deficiencies in, in three or four of these uh, principles. So the first one is, is the broad scope of assets that can be used by businesses as collateral and that banks can accept as collateral. We mentioned that we promote all types of assets to be used, um, both possessory and non-possessory, obviously, uh, tangible, intangible, present, and future, and not only those assets, but also their, their products and proceeds of those assets, right? If I'm, if I'm giving my inventory as collateral, the law should allow that uh, that inventory automatically, um, uh, that, that security interest in the inventory is automatically transferred to the proceeds of, of that inventory because then lenders will not lose uh, that valuable collateral that they have taken. Again, uh, in the region, uh, we see that there are very few types of assets that are accepted um, as collateral. Vehicles, uh, mostly f the, what uh, we know as fonds de commerce, but very little of intangibles, very little account receivables, for example, are used, which is a, an, a very important way of financing. Uh, the types of parties that can create security interest is another uh, gap that we see here. Usually everyone, both legal entities and individuals, should be, should be able to create security interest. There are a number of uh, jurisdictions that ha still have restrictions on who can, act, can create security interest, usually only through corporates and not uh, leaving out uh, most of the SME sector. Uh, and then finally, uh, unifying uh, all the contractual agreements that are securing uh, um, an obligation with movable property should be bound by the same rules. Uh, and that's also an issue that, that we see here. We don't see enough of that. The second, uh, the second main gap is the registries. Uh, um, most of the, the, the concept of a modern registry is a centralized registry, electronic, usually accessible through, uh, through the internet where the lender can very easily and in real time see what the existing security interests are. Uh, it's a notice-based concept where you only enter certain type of information and not all the documentation related to the loan. Well, we see no registries in the region that meet uh, those requirements. Most of, us, of them are paper-based. They're decentralized. They don't, they're not centralized for all types of assets, so only register certain types of assets. And the information is very difficult to access, which uh, defeats the purpose of such a registry. Um, enforcement is, is the third major issue, um, and uh, by the way, we've done, um, the World Bank has done a survey of, of a number of financial institutions in the region, and this was by far the issue that they mentioned that where they saw the major hurdle. 60% of financial institutions saw that enforcing a security interest in the collateral was uh, one of the major constraints. Um, and it's simply because the MENA, re, uh, the MENA countries do not have the possibility of enforcing outside of the judiciary, outside of the court system. This is a critical element of uh, modern secure transaction systems, the possibility for the lender to enforce without having to go to court if it's agreed by the parties, by the way. So here is just a summary. Those, uh, we, we would recommend a strongly focus on those issues, uh, broadening uh, the scope, uh, modernizing the registries, um, flex, um, be more flexible with the enforcement mechanisms, and then creating awareness and, and, uh, and uh, teaching banks and financial institutions how to, uh, how to do this type of work. The way IFC is trying to improve these systems, it's, uh, we have four main pillars um, of work. One is the legal and regulatory framework, where we look at the laws uh, and revise those laws. We draft new laws and regulations. Uh, the second one is obviously the registry, where we assist uh, directly the, the counterparts into creating modern registries through uh, the development of softwares and, and the put it in putting in place the, the right uh, hardware for it. Then we have an important program on building the capacity of stakeholders, including the financial institutions who are going to be the users and the, and the uh, ones lending to the SMEs. And then we put, uh, we put in place an important monitoring and evaluation system that will help uh, governments uh, track those results. 
This is a current portfolio. As you see in the MENA region, um, we have uh, five projects active right now. One of them, you'll see that it's not a country, actually. It's AMF, is the Arab Monetary Fund. So it's the initiative that we've just signed with the Arab Monetary Fund to promote this type of uh, um, project in the region. And then just wanted to finalize the presentation by, by giving you an idea of the potential that this type of reform could have for the region. Here, we've estimated only with the, with the three projects that we have, because Yemen uh, right now, where we have a project, is, is really uh, on hold. But only with the three projects that we have, we have estimated that we can generate about 800 million in financing to SMEs, to about 20,000 SMEs. Can you imagine uh, how many jobs can be created by those 20,000 SMEs that are growing and creating employment? Uh, this is, and this is just the beginning, right? If you expand uh, the, the number of reforms into the region, that could uh, multiply by a number, um, by a, by a two-digit number. Um, the, the, these are some of the results we've gotten in, in different countries, but I won't go through those. And then just finally, um, touching on, on a couple of uh, countries, actually three countries, Mexico, China, and Ghana, where we have had uh, and where, where we have seen uh, an incredible impact after doing this reform. In Mexico, for example, um, only about eight months after the, the reform was completed and the uh, registry was put into place, uh, more than $100 billion in financing has been provided to 95% of the, of the companies that are getting loans secured uh, with movables are, are actually SMEs. Um, in China, it was the number is obviously higher, is 3.5 trillion dollars. But I think we already mentioned this morning some of the results uh, uh, that those SMEs are getting from, right? Like growth, the creation of employment, etc. And then finally, Ghana, which which I think it's a market which might be closer in terms of size, uh, probably to some of the countries in the MENA region, uh, where we're, we're still working in a in a reform project there, um, but the registry has been operating now for about a year, and uh, and only in in a year, um, again, 800 million in financing has been given to firms. There have been banks that have started creating their own initiatives um, for supply chain financing. Uh, the mining sector and the oil sector is actually uh, becoming quite important in Ghana. And so, so that, for example, uh, relates to, to some of the countries here. Uh, but some of the local banks, like Cal Bank, for example, has created financing schemes for the suppliers of the big mining and, and, uh, and oil corporates, where they provide all kind of services to these companies, and they're uh, providing the movable collateral uh, as guarantee for the loans, right? So um, about 100 uh, mi uh, local SMEs have already received loans uh, through this type of uh, lending. And the actual, uh, the, the interesting thing is that there, there have been no NPLs so far uh, in, this, in this type of area. So, so here I, I just wanted to quickly give you uh, some background on this, some examples of uh, how this has um, uh, worked in other countries. But I'm, I'm, I'll be very happy to, to hear some of your concerns and, and questions, and we'll, uh, we'll give now the floor to my colleagues to, to finalize. So thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, so our next speaker on the same subject is uh, Murat Sultanov. Uh, he is the program manager for IFC's advisory services in MENA. And North Africa um, uh, for financial infrastructure, and he's based in Amman in Jordan. Uh, before that, he worked with uh, IFC's advisory services in Central Asia, where his main focus was on, um, on um, developing uh, leasing markets globally, including former Soviet Union, China, and the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, more recently, he has been focusing on developing, developing secure transactions and credit reporting in the MENA region. Um, and uh, he holds an LLM degree from the University of Southampton in the UK. Uh, Murat, please. Thank you, Basim. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Again, very warm welcome to our conference today. Uh, what I would like to talk about in this session um, is I would like to focus more on the MENA region and what has been happening in this region uh, with respect to uh, implementation of the secure transactions reform. Um, Alejandro already explained what secure transactions are, the, 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 the essence of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of this instrument. 
Uh, he already talked about the importance and significance of secure transactions for developing economies uh, and economies in transition and the impact that the secure transactions reform can have for the MENA region. Uh, what I would like to talk more about, however, is IFC's experiences. Uh, we have launched the program, Secure Transactions program, fairly recently, maybe about two years ago. Uh, but nevertheless, we have some interesting lessons that we can share and some interesting experience that we can showcase uh, with respect to implementation of the Secure Transactions reform uh, in, in MENA region. And this is what I would like to focus on in my session. Uh, but before I do so, uh, let me also quickly recap on the, again, main constraints that we have seen exist in the region that prevent financial institutions from using movable properties as collateral. Um, when IFC launches the, uh, the project, uh, before we even decide whether it makes sense for us to, to, inter, to have an intervention in a particular jurisdiction, we, the first thing that we do is we go on a mission and we talk to people. We talk to different stakeholders, we talk to uh, government institutions, ministries, central banks, but we also talk to financial institutions, leasing companies, uh, particularly u uh, users uh, of, the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of this instrument that we're trying to promote. And so when we approach banks and we ask them the question, why your bank, for instance, does not provide, secure, uh, does not provide loans that are secured with uh, things like uh, equipment, machinery, accounts, receivables, inventory, and so forth, the very first question or the very first response that we hear to, the, to, to that question is that, well, you know what, in our, in our jurisdictions, we're not even allowed to do that. If, and, and, and one of the examples is, for instance, Jordan and Palestine, where the existing civil codes do not allow the bank to give a loan to, uh, to a client and then take movable property as collateral and continue allowing this client to use this collateral. So in order for a bank to give a loan that is secured with movable property, a bank must retain possession or hold possession of this property, which really defeats the whole purpose because we do want to allow the debtor or the client to continue using these properties. Um, so, this is a, something that we need to address in the first place. There's a, actually pretty much a prohibition on this kind of transactions. And then there are lots and lots of other things that uh, Alejandro already alluded to uh, in the legal framework that create obstacles and barriers uh, for, uh, for, for, for effective secured uh, transactions. And uh, we talk about the priorities, we talk about the enforcement and so forth. And talking uh, about those issues uh, in, in a bit more detail, uh, we also very often hear that um, even if I can find a way or solution to, to give a loan that is secured as mobile properties. What happens if my client goes into default? How it is possible for me to go and, and, and repossess and take these properties back in an efficient and effective manner? When I'm taking lands and buildings as, uh, as, as a guarantee, I can't afford to sue my client in court for about a year or maybe, maybe even more because lands, they don't depreciate that often. But when it comes to mobile properties, I really need to have some effective mechanisms that exist that would allow me as a, as a bank or as a leasing company to take this property quickly, sell it, and therefore cover all the losses I may have as a result of the client failing uh, to perform his obligations or her obligations under the, uh, under the contract. And we have seen in all the jurisdictions where we worked that these instruments are simply not available. You do need to go to court, and this is very lengthy, and this is very problematic. Another thing uh, that banks are often pointing out is that um, it's not clear what will happen if my client taking the same movable property and using it again to secure its obligations or to, to, to obtain another loan from another bank. What will happen if he's in default? Whether will I have the priority to take this property or will, my, will another bank will have priority or maybe another leasing company will have priority. So, that, so we have seen that legislation in the region does not effectively create a transparent scheme of priorities that is, that is very, very important. Um, and finally, uh, something that Alejandro mentioned is the lack of registry. Banks, leasing companies, pointing out this as a major concern for them, they say, well, if it's a title vehicle or some other uh, special types of movable properties, like securities, for instance, in some of these jurisdictions we do have uh, registries where you can register a vehicle and you can even register a pledge over this vehicle. Of course, we talk. About, it's not always e efficient to. Uh, these systems, these registry systems, are not always efficient to uh, to check the records and then always open to the public in an efficient manner and so forth. But still, they exist and it is possible to register the pledges. But what about equipment? What about machinery? What about accounts? What about inventory? What about all these other assets? There are no registries that we can re that, 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 that can. Um, 
we can use to register this, uh, the, 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 this assets. And therefore, there is absolutely no way for us to know that someone else may have already taken an interest in this property because they are not registered anywhere. So these really fundamentally, the, the, the three or four major, major problems uh, that exist in the region that, that, that prevent uh, secure transactions uh, from happening. Um, but then going back to the main topic of uh, my presentation, which is what is happening in MENA now? A couple of years ago when we launched the program, we have seen that uh, practically uh, there has been no reforms in place. There were uh, some reforms, unfortunately unsuccessful, uh, done in uh, Iraq and in Palestine, where uh, I think some donors were involved in, in, in supporting the uh, enactment of the secure transactions laws. Unfortunately, this, uh, this project never, uh, were never successfully implemented and, and, and any reform didn't, didn't, didn't happen. Um, but then, two years down the road, we have seen that things are changing. But again, as Alejandro said, currently, up till now, there is no single jurisdiction in the region that have already managed to enact the effective law on secure transactions or uh, create uh, an effective uh, collective registry. However, as this slide, this slide illustrates that, the, uh, that a lot of jurisdictions are not thinking uh, and, 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 are, and are planning and already are undergoing through some kind of reform processes. And uh, here you see that um, the reforms already been initiated in, in countries like uh, Palestine, uh, Yemen, Afghanistan, Jordan, and most recently in Lebanon. And a uh, few other countries are just about to launch or planning to launch very soon uh, the reforms in this area. And these countries are Egypt, uh, Iraq, United Arab Emirates, and Pakistan. And in most of these countries, I see actually uh, either has a standalone project that we uh, implement jointly with our uh, counterparts uh, from government, uh, or uh, we are involved in some, in some form or fashion. Just to talk a little bit about this, the program achievements, as I said, uh, we launched the program very, very early, quite recently, just two years ago, and uh, most of you, I guess, would agree that implementing this kind of reform is a long-term process. Um, building an appropriate legal framework, designing the registry, and most importantly, building awareness is, uh, is a long-term effort. But still, we can uh, highlight some of the accomplishments that our program has managed to achieve. Um, in Afghanistan, the law on secure transactions uh, was adopted. Um, as well as all the uh, necessary uh, regulations and bylaws. Um, this really helped boost, the, we talked today about the doing business indicator and, and doing business report and the indicators that uh, that the report contains with respect to getting credit. Um, it helped boost the, uh, the Afghanistan uh, ranking up 50 points just on that. But it, uh, ultimately, the reform, of course, is not for the sake of increasing uh, points, but it is for the sake of seeing the meaningful impact uh, on the ground. Um, and so right now in Afghanistan, uh, after the law has pl uh, been put in place, the collateral registry is uh, in the process of being developed. And in the next couple of months, we expect that the registry will be fully operational. Uh, this, uh, this country really moved as close as we, uh, as we I, I guess, as, as it gets towards uh, achieving the objective of having a proper institutional and legal framework in place. But that's, again, Afghanistan, we don't really consider it as part of the part of manner, really. Uh, well, I, I say actually it does, but... Uh, Talking about the Arab world, I think another country that is uh, moving very closely to, to, to achieving the, the necessary objectives is Palestine, where the law on secure transactions has been approved by the council and has been presented to the, to the president for signature. As soon as the law is in place, uh, then we're going to work in, uh, we're going to move into the second phase, which is developing uh, registry and then doing some awareness work. Uh, we've also seen that uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the government the new government, uh, and the prime minister in particular, and especially Central Bank of Lebanon, are, are, are very keen on seeing this reform in being implemented. Uh, the law has been already drafted with the support from the uh, Central Bank uh, legal advisors and with the support from IFC's expert. Uh, the process now is, is going to support the, uh, you know, the drafting process and, and come up with, the, with a workable draft that we're going to be able to present to the Council of Ministers for further, uh, for further discussion. So this work is, is currently ongoing. And we're also working in parallel in track uh, uh, in parallel on a second track, which is to um, design the collateral registries, and we have done so, as I mentioned, in Afghanistan and even in Palestine. All the technical specifications for the registry has already been prepared, they are there, and we're going to be able to start working on those specifications jointly with other partners like USAID and so forth on designing the, the, the registry system uh, as soon as the law is, 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 is enacted. And of course, uh, again, to emphasize the importance of uh, putting um, 
an appropriate awareness raising, awareness campaign in place, which is absolutely critical if you really want to ensure the success of the reform. We have been conducting a similar conferences, workshops, more, more specific or individual trainings for government institutions, uh, for, for, for private sector uh, banks and, and, and uh, leasing companies and microfinance institutions and so forth. Because it's really important to explain what, what, what are security transactions, what benefits security transactions can, uh, can provide to, uh, to, to the economies. Uh, so they have, we, we have been doing these awareness raising events and we have uh, you know, trained all, about 300 individuals in different countries such as Jordan. Palestine, Afghanistan, Lebanon, uh, and more recently in, in Egypt uh, and, uh, and, and Iraq. In Egypt, in fact, we have uh, conducted quite recently a mission jointly with the, uh, our colleagues from the Arab Monetary Fund um, as part of the Arab Secure Transactions Initiative that uh, my colleague Hafid was talking about earlier. Um, there we have seen that also the, um, uh, the government is very keen on pursuing the reform uh, specifically, the Ministry of Finance has ex expressed its interest to, uh, to support the process and uh, planning to create a working group where we can prepare uh, the draft law and then, and then, and then uh, discuss this with, the, uh, with other stakeholders. And hopefully, uh, we will see this is going to be enacted uh, soon as well. Another point I would like to uh, discuss, in fact, this is the last point uh, of my presentation, uh, is some of the lessons that we have learned, some of the things that we really need to take into account when we are um, planning to implement the reform. Uh, we are really serious about making sure that everything that we do produces impact. So we, so we need to have a meaningful uh, reform uh, of both on the legal side and the, uh, and the, and the uh, uh, institutional framework side too. Um, the first thing that we have learned is that when we launch the project, of course IFC as an international institution, we have our own best practices that we're trying to promote and disseminate. But one of the things that is very important that we've learned is that one size does not fit all. It is absolutely critical to do our homework before we're making any solutions or any, providing any solutions or, uh, or uh, deciding on a particular course of action with respect to, to a project. We need to conduct an assessment, an in-depth assessment, to understand what's going on in this jurisdiction. What are the laws? Where are the gaps? Mo mo most of the gaps would look similar to what I have described in my first slide, but there are some details. And, this, and, and learning and understanding these details is, is very, very important. Just to give you an example, in, uh, in Jordan and in Yemen, when we were starting to think about implementing the project, we have conducted an assessment and we have figured that there is already a leasing law that establishes the priority scheme. And there is all the leasing law that contains an article that calls for creation of the registry uh, based on the notice principle, something that uh, Alejandro already uh, mentioned in his presentation and something that we're going to show you hopefully in the afternoon when we're going to do a live demo of the Cutler Registry. So leasing laws already calling for these types of registration based on the notice principle. So this is already considered best practice. That gives us opportunity to start working on a collateral registry now without necessarily waiting until the whole legal framework for secure transactions is in place. Typically, IFC's best practices tell us that collateral registry simply is a tool. We need to have a legal framework in place, and then the registry is simply going to be a tool to make sure that the legal framework operates and functioning properly. But in cases of Jordan and Yemen, we have seen that we can start building the registry and open it only for leased assets, and it's already going to be useful. This is, this is something that's going to benefit directly le uh, leasing industries in, this, in, in these countries. And then stakeholders will be able to understand how the system works, uh, learn the principles of the notice registration, uh, understand how it differs from the uh, traditional uh, paper-based registers and so forth. So it, it certainly will give uh, huge and good benefits uh, to, uh, to, to, to the system. But then, after several years, when the law on secure transactions is in place that discovers comprehensively all types of security interests that can include loans and consignment and uh, uh, conditional sales and so forth. We can take this registry, convert it very quickly, very simply, do some you know, very brief IT manipulations with it, and open it for all types of security interests based under the new law. So we have seen that in these countries, this leasing law is becoming a very good entry point for us to, to, to move on the reform. So this is just points out to the fact that it's really important to do for everyone to do our homework and understand what's the situation so that we can offer a certain solution. Another point, which is building consensus among private and, private and public sector stakeholders. Um, just because we can 
do a sort of a presentation like this for a government uh, institution and tell them that, well, if you conduct this reform, you're going to get your ranking uh, in increased on the doing business and so forth, does not really constitu constitute um, uh, uh, a, a proper approach. Uh, we need to, by building consensus, what we really mean is we need to explain the benefits and we can really explain the reasons why a particular jurisdictions want to implement this reform along the lines that we are proposing. To, to highlight and showcase the economic benefits and the importance of these uh, systems for, for, for small and medium-sized enterprises. So this is what really matters. And then also what, what matters is that once the draft law is prepared, we need to make sure that we explain the provisions of this draft to all the stakeholders that are, that are involved. One other thing also I wanted to mention regarding the, uh, the preparation of the, of, the, of the laws, and this is one of the uh, one other lessons and experiences that we've learned is that it's, uh, as I said, IFC has its own experiences, and we have our best practices, and we have certain models. But again, one size doesn't fit all, which means when we prepare the law, uh, and I have seen some, so, some other uh, you know, donors who were following this approach, they would simply ask a legal firm to translate it in Arabic language. And then when people looking into it, they really don't understand what's going on, because translation, a simple translation of the law into local language is not going to do the trick. We need to have local legal firms and local lawyers working actively with stakeholders, banks and government institutions, to actually draft the law in Arabic. So there's no such thing as a translation. You need to develop the law in local language to make sure that it completely conforms to all the principles and traditions of the particular jurisdiction. You cannot just uh, you know, take an international model law of Unicetral or EBRD or, or so forth, translate it in, 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 in local language and hope that this is going to solve all the problems, it will not. It's really a bottom-up approach. Another point is it's ever absolutely critical to establish effective relations with the, with the government stakeholders. We need to approach an institution that not only is interested in implementing this reform, but also has their sufficient authority. Enacting the laws is not a very simple process. It, it requires time. Um, and uh, time and a huge effort also, especially since you have to work with the uh, different stakeholders in the Council of Ministers, and then the law goes to the Parliament, you need to work with the Finance Committee, et cetera. You need to have some powerful stakeholder or champion who is going to be driving this process forward. Uh, will understand the benefits, but will also have the, uh, have the authority and the power to implement this reform. And another point is it's very critical to make sure that we continue engaging uh, with everyone until the, the law is completely passed and totally enacted, which means our role doesn't stop at the time when we have presented the draft to the steering committee, for example, or to a working group, or even to a council of ministers. It's important that we continue making our resources available uh, for all these stakeholders that are involved in the process of enacting the law. So we need to work not only just with the working group or members of this committee, we need to work with the uh, responsible government entity, we need to work with the legal committee of the Council of Ministers, legislative and opinion bureaus in some countries, Ministry of Justice in some countries, and then finance committee of the parliament, and so, so on and so forth until the law is completely improved. If we don't do that, the major risk is that the uh, some changes can be introduced along the process of enacting the law that will negatively impact the reform. So, so the draft that we prepared conforms to the best, best practice and it, in, it includes all the necessary uh, standards uh, and it is in conformity also with local standards. However, if we don't continue providing support to other people who have authority to make some changes in it, we have seen that sometimes changes are introduced that are negative and that in the end of the day you can have the law that is not really uh, cannot really be considered to constitute an effective uh, secure transactions uh, legal, legal reform. And just a very, uh, very final uh, point, again, on the awareness raising. Yes, it's important to start with the law. We need to have legal framework. We need to have the registry. But then even if you have the law in the registry, it's impossible uh, to, uh, to envision that uh, the system is going to be used immediately. Um, judges will not know how the new, uh, for example, uh, extrajudicial procedures or self-help repossession procedures are, are functioning. Uh, lawyers will not know how to structure the agreements uh, to make sure that they are ensuring their priorities, for example, or how they need to, uh, the, what sort of provisions and articles to put in the, in, in the contract in line with this new legislation. Um, the banks, most importantly, would not know how to conduct this kind of transactions 
we, we, we talk about uh, lending secured with accounts receivables. This is something that uh, generated $3.5 trillion in China, as Alejandro said. But before they actually managed to start doing something, there was a huge effort put in place to educate banks and explain to them how to do the risk management and, and the risk assessment, how to evaluate accounts receivable. Before banks will take the risk of taking accounts receivable as a, as a collateral, they will need to understand how to manage that and what, what, what really happens there. So, so, so putting uh, uh, um, substantive educational sort of um, or awareness raising campaign in place becomes very, very critical. So this is pretty much uh, briefly the lessons that we've learned in the, in the last couple of years implementing this program. And uh, with that, I will, uh, I will, will stop and I, I guess uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue uh, with our forum. Thank you, Murat. Uh, so our next uh, and final speaker on the topic uh, is uh, Dr. Mohammed Mustafa Khadr, uh, who is the Secretary General of the Near East, North Africa Rural and Agricultural Credit Association uh, since 1986. Uh, he has experience of more than 40 years uh, in the field of rural finance in many places in the region. Uh, he holds uh, a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and uh, a Master's in Public Administration and Farm Management and a PhD in Agricultural Economics. Dr. Mohammed. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, IFC for inviting me to attend this meeting. Uh, actually, I'm coming from probably different environment. Um, the presentation here will be uh, about the experience in agricultural lending, which is a little bit different than uh, commercial lending. Uh, my uh, presentation will be related to agricultural banks because Ninaraka combines agricultural banks in the region from Morocco to Pakistan and Turkey. All the agricultural banks are members in, in Iraqa. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, presentation will be based on the experience which gathered about lending in this uh, field of uh, credit. Now we'll start with the official definition of loan collateral according to the banking laws in the region. Um, before I start, I was told by my colleague Murad to speak in Arabic, but I found that all the lectures given in English, therefore I have to follow suit. And uh, probably the lecture is, is, is written in, in Arabic and it's ready for uh, distribution if anybody wants to, to, to see it. Uh, loan collateral is the measures taken by finance institution to protect their money uh, from misuse or loss. Such measures consist of the of placing belong placing of belongings, guarantees or pledges with a cash value equal to or more than the amount of loan issued under the control of the lender so that they may resort to it and convert it to cash to cover his losses should the borrower fail to repay the loan according to the conditions agreed on. Uh, types of loan collaterals, I think um, this part have been covered by previous colleagues, but I'll go quickly uh, over this uh, part of the presentation. First, mortgage of fixed or immovable assets. Uh, this in includes the official mortgage of officially registered immovable or fixed assets, which are presented by the borrower as collateral in his loan. This method involves the mortgage of fixed assets with the official government offices responsible for the exchange uh, or sale and purchase of these assets. Fixed assets include agricultural and non-agricultural land, buildings, and various types and form of real estate. In this case, the borrower would not be able to sell these fixed assets except with the approval of the lender 
and after repaying his debts. Uh, another type, which is movable assist, this is used in all countries in the region. Uh, I'm still talking about agricultural uh, loans. Machinery such as trucks, tractors, or fishing boats are mortgaged with the office responsible for registering these vehicles so that their owner may not sell them except with the approval of the lender. Uh, the third one, bank guarantees. A commercial bank operating in the country provides a letter of guarantee, uh, guaranteeing a loan for a specific individual according to specific conditions. Uh, shares and bonds. Some banking regulations, certain countries such as Oman, Tunisia, Iran, uh, and Jordan accept shares and bonds as collateral to the extent of their face value. Uh, this is in their rules, but actually not much applied. Uh, deposits, bank deposits are accepted as collateral on the condition that they uh, be blocked for a period that covers the term of the loan. Uh, the um, borrower can't uh, withdraw his deposit unless he pays the loan in this case. Uh, personal guarantees uh, personal guarantees are affected within certain limits when they are signed by one or two guarantors. And uh, this is applied in small loans and microcredit of agricultural banks. <coughs> and uh, uh, it is a way of uh, facilitating the uh, giving these categories of uh, borrowers uh, rural or agricultural credit. Uh, crop bleaching or warehouse receipts. There are many types of crop bleaching. This is accepted in case where there is a low level of risk involved. It uh, means that where the lender is certain about the quantity and quality of the future crop, accompanied with the availability of government uh, price incentive, incentives for the delivery of the crop to the bank when the bank has its own uh, warehouses or the state. This is mainly applied in countries where cropping environment is promising in terms of stable and enabling weather conditions and the availability of permanent source of water. The crops which may be involved in this method are grains and cotton. This collateral method is accepted in Tunisia, Algeria, and Iran if the crop is insured. Uh, warehouse receipts are accepted, whereby the crop is received and stored in either bank warehouses or state silos or joint warehouses. In such cases, the borrower would be able to use the receipts as collateral to receive loans from the bank who is in most cases is the owner of the warehouse. In some countries where Islamic modes of finance are applied in rural finance, the most important mode of finance called by a salim, advanced contracting is used. Future crop is used as a guarantee to the loan according to certain rules. Uh, last but not least, uh, post date checks or employees' salaries, I think somebody talked about that. Um, this is actually not collateral, but it is collateral backing measures. In many countries, post date checks are accepted as collateral backing measures on the condition that they are accompanied by other collateral, such as personal guarantee. Mainly, most of the cases, it is used with personal guarantee. Jordan and Oman also accept employees' salaries as backing collateral measure on the condition they are accompanied by a personal guarantee. Ratio of loan amount to collateral value. Um, this ratio varies from country to country and from activity to another. In Jordan, the accepted percentage is 75 percent. Uh, in Oman, it is 80 percent, and in Oman, Cyprus, in Egypt, this percentage range between 40 and 70 percent. 40 for movable and 70 for immovable. In Syria, 80 percent of the value of the collateral is the 
uh, if the collateral is a fixed asset and 60 if it is chattel collateral. Uh, 70 to 100 in Sudan and 60 to 90 in Iran. Here the margin between uh, 175, um, usually this um, is taken uh, for um, uh, securing the interest rate, the interest which should, uh, will be uh, accumulated if the borrower doesn't pay his loan. Evaluation of collateral <coughs> methods and problems. In Jordan, the collateral, the collateral is valued by a governmental committee composed of representative from the bank and from the land registration office. Pakistan honors a certificate from the land revenue department. In Syria, schedules of the value of land in all areas of, of Syria are prepared and reviewed regularly by a committee consisting of representatives from the bank and the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Association. In Egypt, specialized private companies or committees are used for evaluating uh, lands. Here we come to valuation problems uh, regarding to the collateral in general. In many countries, land is still not surveyed and not officially allocated to their owners. This is the case in most Arab countries. Therefore, owners do not possess official deeds or titles. Brewers may sell the mortgage land without the knowledge of the lender and without repaying their debts. Agriculture banks in Yemen, Morocco, Tunisia, Sudan, and Oman are faced with this problem, and even more than these countries. The borrower pays a fee to the committee evaluating the land. The evaluation often requires some time to complete. The issuance of loans to borrowers in, in, in is thus delayed, and the loan transaction cost also increases. Another problem is that the value of the collateral is subject to continued fluctuations. When prices decline, the bank loan is no longer fully guaranteed. Uh, last, the borrower bears the cost of mortgaging the land with the government departments, which is in agriculture considered um, additional cost and higher transaction cost. Uh, legal procedure to be followed and possibilities or difficulties in foreclosure or enforcement for selling the collateral. Very rarely do finance institutions resort to the sale or foreclosure on collateral in case of default. Very rare. During the past 30 years in Cyprus, Tunisia, Jordan, Sudan, and Jordan, there has only one, has been a limited number of cases when this procedure has been used. Why? Collateral put up for sale is not purchased by others because of social ties and for moral reasons. Most banks view themselves as development banks. Their assigned role is to help the farmer rather than to express appropriate his land. In most cases, delinquency occurs as a result of factors beyond the control of the borrower, especially in years of, of a big drought. And this is, uh, uh, happens uh, almost every year or every two years. It is a cumbersome for the bank to enter into foreclosure procedures for a large number of borrowers in case of mass delinquency. And mass delinquency is very familiar in agriculture. Uh, requires lengthy and routine procedures which agriculture banks avoid getting involved in, as well as entailing additional costs to the borrower and the lender. I can here uh, conclude that collateral in the region are used as means of placing moral pressure on borrowers. The bank uses it as a last resort to collect already bad or debt debts. But it is not an effective device, 
even if it is real estate mortgage, to effect timely pay payment. I'm saying here timely pay payment. Uh, because uh, according to local uh, laws and regulations, if the loan is not repaid in 30 days, it considered be uh, delinquent or uh, bad or whatever uh, called in, in, in different countries. Uh, timely pay repayment um, uh, in agriculture is very difficult even if there is a real estate mortgage. Collateral should always accompany it with other practical means of loan collection measures. Therefore, we have to resort to other uh, loan collection measures like post dated checks uh, and other kind of uh, administrative and financial measures. Other substitutes for securing loans, there are alternative methods used in the region on small scale, such as what's called guarantee funds. These exist in Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. In Egypt, there are some specialized companies providing guarantees to small loans. We have also agricultural insurance is offered in the region by state-owned institutions, such as in Cyprus, Sudan, and Iran. Morocco and Tunisia stipulate insurance on the finance assets. Insurance in these two countries is provided by private companies. It should be noted that insurance is not a substitute for collateral requirements in the region, but it is strengthens the ability of the borrower to repay the loan and the lender to safeguard his money. Uh, bank positions of collateral management in the region, a study carried out by Nina Rakia and the FAO, showed that the agricultural banks in the region were flexible in dealing with the issue of collateral. Uh, in most agricultural banks, collateral ranged from real estate mortgage uh, to facilitate uh, giving small loans. Uh, uh, no, sorry, real estate mortgage for big loans to personal guarantee for small loans or micro credit. Uh, now we move to a suggestion for improving rural finance efficiency in the field of loan collateral. I mean here in agriculture also. I have to remind you all the time that this is related to agriculture. There is a need for simplifying legal procedures in state-owned banks because most agriculture banks are state-owned banks and decreasing the time and cost required for mortgaging collateral and the liquidation thereof through the following. To consider the bank money if the bank is state-owned as treasury money, which would be subject to the policies and rules for the collection of state money. To consider the money of the bank as government money. We call it Amwal Amiriye. To consider the loan document as official, an official document recognized by the judiciary and executable without requiring a new court decision. Uh, this is a very long procedure, usually takes a lot of time to go to the court. Uh, I, ha I know in Jordan it's, it's considered like, like that. Uh, there is no need to, the, to go to the court. The, the, the uh, loan uh, documents is considered as um, a judiciary uh, decision, and it's final. Therefore, it's, it's uh, a very good uh, arrangement uh, to decrease the time and the cost. Uh, exempt, exempting mortgage procedures from fee, the state charge borrowers, since bank money is public money. And also, this is to decrease the cost uh, paid by the borrower. Valuation of loan collateral, uh, another way of improving the situation, the bank itself must undertake the evaluation of collateral without resorting to outside evaluators, so as not to delay the issuance of loans to borrowers. When evaluating the loan collateral, the value of improvement, also this is another one, introduced by the loan would be considered a part of the value of land to be used for, for uh, mortgage. Um, 
usually when you go to outside evaluators, you need time and much of cost, and the borrower would uh, incur such kind of cost. Therefore, I, I think it's better to be within the bank itself. Use of collateral substitutes, this includes the following. Establish a security funds financed by the borrowers and the banks, as it was mentioned in, in, in Maghreb countries. Create a linkage between credit and marketing, especially when the latter is government agency, uh, which is currently called value chain finance. Um, this uh, very good method of um, deducting the loans when the, 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 the crop is delivered to a government agency. Open bank accounts for borrowers and the use of such accounts as collateral. It is already used in some countries, but not in many of them. Use the assessment of credit worthiness and repayment capacity if, if viable as a first line defense for loan guarantee. And this is the most uh, recent way of using um, credit for, uh, for women and the poor. Uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, utility receipts may be one of the methods which um, lead us to, to know about the repayment capacity of the uh, future borrowers. Uh, personal guarantee vis-a-vis -vis real mortgage. Uh, this is the most easy type of credit or, or uh, guarantee or collateral uh, against the most difficult uh, method of uh, real estate uh, mortgage uh, or collateral. In some countries, it would be easier and less costly for the borrower to pledge his land if he owns a land than providing one or two financially viable guarantors. And this is very clear in, uh, in Jordan and even in Palestine. Um, if a borrower, if a small borrower uh, comes and gets a loan, it's easier for him to provide his title and to have his title mortgage than to bring uh, financially viable one or two guarantors. Uh, in addition, putting a sign of mortgage on the land in the land registrar department or lifting this mortgage are effected without fee and through a simple correspondence without occupying the uh, borrower's effort or time. Conclusion, the problem of rural finance in the region does not strongly pose the issue of collateral. It is actually not a matter of collateral. Rather, it is the social and economic, or is the social and economic environment. Agriculture banks are viewed by the farmers and policy makers, are state-owned institutions that must provide credit at almost low or negative interest rate. Maybe some of you, the first time hear this uh, uh, information. And with a frequent exemption of borrowers from repayment of their debts. Also, unfavorable macroeconomic policies negatively affect.